Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. This is uh, the second part of the lesson that I began last week by talking about making a difference through conduct. Uh, What are the things that we can do or how can we let our lives impact other people to the point where they want to learn more about Jesus? Or they want to know more about why we live our lives the way that we live them. What's so special about Jesus that causes us to change and that may actually help others to change some things about their lives too? That's kind of the the thesis statement for these two lessons. And we've been going off of Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Uh, excuse Well, actually going through chapter 10 and verse 1. And what I talked about last week was basically the principles that we learn from Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38. Uh, With Jesus, he came into this village, he saw people's needs, he did what he needed to do to meet those needs, and only when he did the things that people needed him to do for them did his message really not just make any sense, but was it it able to make the impact on the people that it needed to? And so that's what we talked about last week, is that uh, when we make a difference through conduct, it's largely about the things that, that we do before other people so that they will want to know more about Jesus, and that in turn will open doors that we, uh, for us to talk about them. Now, we looked at a couple of different things regarding this mindset. Uh, the one thing that we looked at was the book of Acts itself. We have an inspired document in our New Testament called the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, largely, what the book of Acts is about, or what the full context of the book is about, is about how the gospel is able to spread from Jerusalem to Rome. We don't find a whole lot of doctrinal things in the book of Acts. We find a few things. We find some things about uh, baptism and about how to become a Christian. We find some things about uh, some, some gospel sermons and about how the Old Testament fits with what we are trying to do in the New Testament church. Uh, We find some things, but largely what the book of Acts is about, it's about how the apostles and the earliest Christians lived their lives to spread the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. And only when they did that could Paul write many of the letters that we have in our New Testament. Not every letter Paul wrote, but many of the letters that Paul wrote were written within the time frame that the book of Acts is falling into. And so that's kind of what we talked about last week, and we looked at how we can be better examples by, or be, by being lights to the world around us and things of that nature. But today, still in keeping with Matthew chapter 9, uh, actually chapter 10 and verse 1, this is the point that I want to make. He did all of these things in verses 35 through 38 of chapter 9, but then in chapter 10 and verse 1 it says this, He called to him his twelve disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Basically, what we learn in chapter 10 and verse 1 is that everything that Jesus did in this community, when he went in there, healed every disease, every affliction, all the things that he did served as a bridge for his disciples to go and do the exact same things that he did. Jesus was an example to his disciples. The things that he did was supposed to transition into their lives. And that's what I want us to talk about today. What Jesus did serving to be an example to the disciples and what they did, and they could go out, they could heal diseases, they could heal afflictions, they could preach the gospel, they could do what they needed to do to prepare other people for Jesus. But you might be thinking to yourself, as, as I did at first, thought about this uh, actual objection that people could make. Well, wait a minute. This, these are the apostles. These are the 12 people that were handpicked by Jesus to do this. Of course Jesus could set the example for them. Of course he could send them on a journey and do mission work and things. Well, we are so different than these 12 apostles. This is not the same thing. Oh, yes, it is. 
Because remember what we find in Luke chapter 10 and verse 1. Jesus, here he sends out the 12 apostles, but in Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, he sends out 72 people. We don't know those 72 people, or at least we don't know all of them. We can speculate, maybe the two that were on the road to Emmaus that Jesus had a conversation with in Luke 24, maybe those two people were part of the 72. People have speculated. We may speculate about the specifics of who those 72 people were, but we are not given their names because they were just simple disciples of Jesus. And Jesus sent them to prepare hearts for other people, or pre to, to prepare hearts for Jesus to come into theirs. So what are we doing to prepare other people for Jesus? What are we doing to prepare the hearts of others for Jesus to come and live within their own hearts and to change something about their lives? There's a lot of things that we can do. There are a lot of things that have been done in the past, in my opinion, that do not suffice with preparing other people for Jesus. But there are a lot of things that we can do by the way that we live our lives to prepare people, not just for Jesus, but for the gospel that is centered around Jesus Christ. So when we think about this, I want us to look at Jesus being an example to other people. There are a lot of things that we, can, that we can do to impact the lives of people, but largely what our life needs to consist of is a lifestyle that causes people to see Jesus in us to the point where they marvel at our lives. Not because we want notoriety, not because they're blown away by the people that we are and what, how we are so great, but we reflect Jesus in our lives so much that they're blown away by it. Let me share with you an example of this from Acts chapter 4. Turn your Bibles uh, very quickly to Acts chapter 4. This little section of Scripture, every time I read it, it, it impacts me. Every time I see the specifics that are, that are told about Peter and John. Let me give you some context. Back in chapter 3, you've got this lame beggar that sits at the beautiful gate. And he always asks for alms. He's consistent. People expect him to be there. Well, Peter and John are coming up to the temple, and they see this guy laying here. Well, to make a long story short, Peter says, Well, I don't have any silver or gold to give you, but what I do have, I give to you. He says, In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he take, Peter takes him by the hand, raises him up, and all of a sudden his legs are strengthened, and he begins leaping and praising God. And not just him leaping and praising God, but all the other people that saw it, saw what Peter and John did. And so they're all walking into the temple with Peter and John just awestruck at what has happened to this lame guy because he's been lame ever since birth. Well, if you go back to chap go over to chapter 4 and verse 22, you learn that he's over 40 years old. He's been lame for over 40 years. And now all of a sudden he's walking because Peter raised him up. Well, obviously, Peter's going to start talking about, hey, let me tell you something. It's not my power that's done this. It's the power of Jesus of Nazareth. And he begins to preach the gospel. But when we read chapter 4, we read about the Sadducees. They don't like it because, Peter, if you're going to speak, preach about Jesus, you've got to talk about the resurrection. And so Peter starts talking about the resurrection. The Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection, so they don't like Peter's message, and they start to cause all kinds of fuss. Well, Peter and John, they're arrested. They go before some specifics, verse 6 of chapter 4. Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, and John and Alexander, and all who are of the high priestly family. So they're before a group of people that are very notarized in the Jewish community. And they begin to talk about Jesus as well. They talk about who he is, what he has done, how powerful his life is. And when you look at verse 11, Peter says this. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter is really emphatically honing in on what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. He's preaching with boldness. Now look at verse 13. 
Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. Your translation might say, they marveled. Why did they marvel? They recognized that they had been with Jesus. What caused them to preach the way that they preached? What caused them to live the way that they did? What caused them to rub off on this group of people of the high priestly family? Uh, remember, Caiaphas is the one that was high priest when Jesus was put on the cross. What caused them to just be awestruck by the things that Peter was saying and doing? He recognized that they had been with Jesus. Do people look at the way that we live our lives? Do they look at the way that we talk, the way that we walk, the way that we do everything that we do, whether it has to do with uh, Christian service or not? Do people see Jesus living in us? When people look at my life, do they say, I know exactly why he does what he does. He spent some time with Jesus. Do we spend our times reading the Gospels, other New Testament documents, learning more about Jesus so that we can reflect His life in ours, not just to change us, but to live our lives in such a way that other people can be changed too. This group of men recognized that Peter and John had been with Jesus. They couldn't deny it. Now, I would love to say that every one of them obeyed the gospel in the following verses. They don't. They beat them, charged them not to speak again, but when we continue reading, Peter goes out and keeps on preaching. But they recognize that they've been with Jesus. Today, what I want to talk about is Jesus as our example. And here in just a little bit, I want us to look at a couple of... Um, I want us to look at a couple of examples of what Jesus has done to be our, to provide an example for us. There are three places I want us to look at in Scripture that specifically say Jesus did this as an example. And that's what I want us to look at. Uh, but let's think about Jesus' belief in us. Because that's what I talked about last week. And that's what his entire life was about. Jesus didn't just do this when he was an adult and when he began his ministry. Jesus has always been about the business of being an example to other people. Let's go all the way back to Jesus as a boy. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus was 12 years old. He and his family, they go to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. After they get done with their Passover festivities, then they start to go home. But after they start to go home, they realize they don't have Jesus with them. So they go back to Jerusalem, they continue to look for Jesus, they've looked for him for three days, and finally they find him where? In the temple, asking and answering questions. And everybody's blown away by it. They can't believe that this 12-year-old boy knows the things that he knows, is smart as he is. But you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, this is Jesus of Nazareth. This is the Christ. This is the Son of God. This is not just any ordinary human being. This is Jesus Christ. We know that. They didn't. For all they knew, this was just a 12-year-old boy that was smarter than most people they'd ever seen. Probably had never seen anybody that knew the things that he knew at this particular age. And the fact that he knew those things, the, the fact that he cared as much as he did as a 12-year-old boy, just blew their minds. I've known a lot of people that were very smart for their age. I know of a boy that was being homeschooled and to get a high school education with the path that he was on, he had to have a foreign language. He decided that the foreign language he wanted to learn for his high school credit was biblical Greek. And so he got the preacher to, to ask him if he would teach him biblical Greek for his high school credit. The preacher agreed. They met once or twice a week. And the guy was just, I mean, he was amazing. His intellectual ability was wonderful. He just absorbed it like a sponge, even at an early age. Well, he got a little bit older, got a little bit older, graduated high school, decided to go to the Army. 
He went to the army, and he threw everything away. Left the church, everything. Why did he do that, you ask? This guy is a smart guy. What does this have to do with what I just talked about with Jesus? Well, we're talking about influence, right? The bad influence that absorbed his life in the army took him away from everything that he knew, everything that he had given his life over to prior to that was done away with because of a bad example. We need to let Jesus change our lives for the better. When other people see Jesus living in me, that's notable. Not only is it notable, notable to us, but it's notable to others as well. So what about this example? Let's look at a few of them as we go through the lesson today. The first one is this. Jesus was, uh, gave the example of humble service. Let's look at uh, John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Look at verse 15. Jesus says this, For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. There are a lot of things that we could point out in this text, but with the idea of, of a humble servant, what Jesus is saying here, or what Jesus is doing here, and, and, and kind of, there are a lot of different things we can learn from this, but here's what I want us to think about as we look at this text. Humble service is not about what other people do for me, it's about what I do for other people. That's what humble service is about. That should not surprise any of you for me to say that, but that's what humble service is about. And it's found reflected in the life of Jesus. When you look at the life of Jesus, who he is, he's the son of God, he's emptied himself, he's, he's left heaven, he's come to earth. When you think about that entire scenario, who should be serving who? I should be serving Jesus. He should not be the one serving me. I should be the one serving him. But that's not what humble service is about. When Jesus offers the example of humble service, it means that he does what we need. And that's what humble service is about. It's not about what others do for me. It's about what I do for another person. That's humility. And humble service is reflected in the nature of what Jesus does here as a whole. He washes his disciples' dirty feet. I remember when I was a kid, being in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, probably even a little bit older than that, teachers would often ask me this, and not just in grade school, but in church class, whatever it was, teachers would often ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, what do you hear? What I want to be when I grow up, when I'm five or six years old or a little bit older, uh, well, I want to be a baseball player, professional baseball player. Or I want to be a pilot. Or I want to be a race car driver or something like that. Not once have I ever heard any kid say, and I'm talking about myself as well, that I want to be a servant. I want to wash things for a living. Nobody's going to say that as a seven or eight year old kid. Because that's not the first thing we think about when we think of great things that we can do with our lives. You think about a restaurant worker. Who's the dishwasher? Are they the ones writing the checks every week to the employers? Are they the ones that own the business? Are they the ones making all the money? There's nothing wrong with washing dishes, don't get me wrong. But they are not the ones that are at the top of the totem pole in that business. They're the ones that start out low and they work their way up. Jesus is way up here on the totem pole. I mean, he is the standard of the totem pole. You can't get any higher than him. But what has he done? He's taken himself all the way down the ladder to the very bottom to offer the example of service. In John chapter 1, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In the very same section of Scripture, he said, I'm not worthy to untie this man's sandals. The person that washed the dirty feet of the people entering the house 
was the lowest of the low. You could not get any lower in the house. That was the lowest job a person could do. And Jesus lowered himself. For what? Because examples are powerful. What are some other things we learn from this text? Well, look at verses 1 through 3. We learn, first of all, that Jesus substitutes selfishness for love. Verses 1 through 3, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that this hour had come, to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put, his, uh, put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. Two things. I'll talk about Judas here in just a little bit. But I want us to look at two things that are said here. One in verse 1, the other in verse 3, where I get this idea of Jesus substituting selfishness for love. It says, verse 1, it says that having loved his own who were in the world, he, uh, well, excuse go, go back up. When Jesus knew that this hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Now take that thought and go to verse 3. Knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. What's verse 3 all about? What's the point of verse 3? What John is saying in verse 3 is after Jesus has accomplished everything that he was supposed to accomplish in his public ministry, he was going to the Father. He'd done everything that he was supposed to do. Sure, he's got to go to the cross. He knows that as soon as he leaves this upper room, he's about to be betrayed, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be put on trial, he's going to be beaten, he's going to suffer, and he's going to put, be put on a cross. He knows all of those things are taking place. As soon as he leaves the upper room, Jesus has done everything he needs to do. So why in the world stay here when he doesn't have to and wash the disciples' dirty Because it's about loving other people. It's not about selfishness. It's not about Jesus getting off this earth as quick as he can so he can go back to the Father. It's about him offering an example to his disciples. Because he says again in verse 15, I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. I kind of wonder, man, why did the disciples need this example to begin with? Apparently, they don't understand completely what service is all about. So what does Jesus do? Jesus provides that example for them. Jesus stayed in the upper room and washed the disciples' feet because after he did this, he knew their relationship with each other would change forever. And that's why he did it. It wasn't about him. It's about other people. Remember, being a humble servant. It's not about what people do for me. It's about what I do for other people. But also, when we think about service, humble service, it's essential that we do it. It's not an optional thing. With the essentiality aspect, let's look at Peter. Look down at verse 6. It says, He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord... Do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Life in the church is about doing things for God that we don't understand. Have you ever noticed that? Why can't I worship with an instrument? I don't know. I don't know why we can't. That's the way God designed it. I don't understand why. It's not up to me to ask questions. I just do what God said. Why is it essential for me to be baptized for the remission of my sins? Why did God want things that way? I don't know. I don't understand it. I should not care. All that should matter to me is God asked me to do something, therefore I do it. Here, Jesus wants to wash Peter's feet. Peter doesn't understand why. He doesn't want to do it. Jesus says, what you don't understand now, you will come to understand very much so later on after I've already done it. 
Life in the church is about doing things that we don't understand. But look at verse 8. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Peter's always the vocal one, right? He's always the one that's doing what nobody else wants to do, saying what nobody else will say. And I say that because if you go back, this is just a side note, but go back to John chapter 4 and verse 27. This is after Jesus speaks with the woman at the well. The disciples go into the, the, to the city of Samaria to buy food. Well, they come back and they said just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek or what are you talking, uh, why are you talking with her? That's what they're thinking. Why is he talking with this woman? We're not supposed to be in Samaria anyway. But not only that, but he's sitting here having a conversation with this woman. Why is he doing that? That's what they were thinking. But nobody would say it. Peter's always the one that's willing to do what nobody else wants to do. He's willing to say what nobody else wants to say. Now I say that because Peter's not elevating himself above the rest of the disciples here. Peter's not saying, you're not going to wash my feet. If you want to wash everybody else's feet, you go right ahead. But you're not washing mine. I don't think that's what Peter's doing here. I think Peter is just the one that's willing to say what all of the other disciples are not willing to say, but that's what they're thinking. Because he's always the one that's willing to say and do uh, what the other disciples don't in Scripture. Getting out of the boat, walking on water. Um, I'm never going to deny you, so on and so forth, all kinds of different, different things. But look at Jesus' response. Do you think service in the church is important? If you don't, read again what Jesus' response to Peter is. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. No part with me, your translation might say. No fellowship with me is basically what Jesus is saying. If I refuse to serve my brothers and sisters in Christ, if I refuse to be a humble servant the way that Jesus was, I don't have any fellowship with Jesus Christ. So what's naturally Peter's response? Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. These disciples were already clean. They didn't need Jesus to wash their feet to receive anything that they had not already received from him. Now, after he dies on the cross, that's a different story because baptism will be instituted and all of that and they will need to have their sins washed away, I believe. But they're already clean at this point. So why in the world wash their feet if they're already clean? Because it's not about the foot washing per se. It's about the example of humble service. It's essential. And again, it's not optional. And I'll say this very quickly before we move on to look at the other two examples. Verse 2. During supper, when the devil had already put into, Ju into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Verse 11. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Jesus could have very well come to, si come to, to Judas and said, Judas, I know what you're about to do. I know you're about to go betray me for 30 pieces of silver. I know that one of the main reasons that I'm going to die on a Roman cross here in just a little bit is because of you. But I'm still going to wash your feet. We may want to serve other people that serve us, but we may want to refuse service of other people that haven't done anything for us. Guess what? It's not optional. I don't pick and choose the people that I serve. I serve everyone because it's not about selfishness. It's about love. It's not about me. It's about other people. It's about Jesus setting the example for me. We could talk about this passage for three days, but I've got to move on. Secondly, the accepting servant. Let's look at 1 Timothy 1, verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16. 
Let's read verse 12. Real quick, uh, verses 12 and 13. Let's go ahead and read 12 and 13 because I think it will help us understand more fully what Paul is thinking as he's writing this. He says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. I went ahead and went through verse 14. What does that have to do with being the example of acceptance? Verse 16 says this, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, or as the first, or the chief, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience, as an example to those who are to believe in Him for eternal life. Sometimes people doubt themselves. And they doubt themselves to the point, not just, can I actually do what God wants me to do? Can I actually uh, obey the gospel? Can I actually be the person that God wants me to be? Many people doubt themselves and ask questions of themselves when it comes to things like that. But what Paul is trying to say here and what God's trying to understand by allowing Paul through the Holy Spirit to write this by inspiration, he's trying to get us to understand that if Paul can be saved, anybody can be saved. Paul was an example to everybody in the world that whenever I doubt my salvation, I look at Paul. And I notice what happened to Paul. What did God do for Paul? What, is, what was Paul before that? Well, we read verse 12 because I thought it was important for us to see. He appointed me faithful to his service, even though I was a persecutor, even though I was a blasphemer, even though I was all these bad things and tried to destroy the church. Jesus still said, hey, I can make an example out of you. And your example will serve to teach everybody else that we must never doubt whether or not we can be saved. But I want us to think about something else that's a little bit different, a little bit of a twist here. That's the main message that Paul's teaching here. I'm an example that everybody can be saved. God will accept everybody, but how is that able to take place? It's able to take place because Jesus Christ displays his, the ESV says, perfect patience. I like the New King James better. It says, all long suffering. The word that's translated patience literally means all or every. So you've got all patience or all long suffering or all endurance. Let me tell you what is not going on here. What Paul is not saying is that Jesus exhausted his patience. Every ounce of patience that Jesus had was given to Paul. He didn't have anything left. That puts limitations on Jesus. I don't think that's what Paul's saying here. What Paul is saying here is that Jesus' patience stretches way beyond human understanding. That's what Paul's saying. I'm able to be the person that I am because Jesus has a patience that none of us could ever understand or ever comprehend. When we think about the life of Paul, what wows us about his Christian life the most? I'll tell you what wows me about his Christian life the most is his sufferings. The things that he went through for Jesus and for the sake of his apostolic authority and his spread of the gospel. That's what I marvel at the most when I look at the life of Paul. But what Paul is saying here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 is that there's something else about my life that people ought to marvel at. Not what I've done as a Christian, but the fact that I'm able to be one to begin with. Because Jesus set the example for everyone that He accepts everyone who has the desire to come to him and to be saved. Finally, the suffering servant. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter uh, 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 21 says this. 
For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Go back to verse 19. Let's read verses 19 and 20. It'll make a lot more sense of what verse 21 is trying to say. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Let me ask you this. When Jesus suffered, did he suffer because he was doing everything that was wrong? When Jesus suffered, was it because he was living his life in neglect of the Father? Because he was living his life completely the opposite of the way God wanted Jews to live? Was he bashing people every chance that he got? Was he living his life under his own right when he suffered? No. He was doing everything correctly. He suffered while he did good. That's the example that he set for us. It doesn't do me any good to suffer if I'm not doing what's right. But if I suffer when I'm trying to live for God... That's a gracious thing in the sight of God, Peter says. When it comes to suffering, here's what suffering is about. Suffering, God allows me to suffer not to weaken my faith. He allows me to suffer to strengthen it. And until I learn to look at my sufferings as ways for me to catapult myself up in faithfulness and obedience to God, I will never see suffering as a good thing. Suffering is a great thing for a Christian because Jesus suffered for us, leaving us an example so that we might follow in His steps. Is Christianity worth it? Is it worth it? Jesus says yes. Paul says yes. God says yes. Every Christian that we read about in the New Testament that was faithful to the Lord says yes. It is worth it. As we close, I want to say this. Everything that we've looked at this morning has been an example of Jesus, an example for who, an example for us. So in other words, what we say to kind of summarize everything that I've said this morning, Jesus would never ask you and I to do something that he would not do himself. Jesus was a humble servant. Jesus accepted everyone as having the opportunity to be saved. And he suffered for the sake of our glorification. Jesus is an example for me. How do I know that I can make a difference through conduct? Because everything that Jesus did for me allows me to live the life that I am able to live today. You may be here this morning and you need to change something about your life. Maybe you're not living your life for Jesus the way that you need to. It may be that you are a Christian this morning, but you've kind of forgotten how important it is for you to pay attention to every step that you make. Come back home. Ask for forgiveness. Ask for prayers of the church. Let us comfort you and strengthen you. There may be someone here today that's not a Christian. They want to wash their sins away, and they want to become a Christian to be added to the Lord's church. That opportunity for you to do that stands today as well. You need to respond for any reason.